I am so delighted to introduce this next amazing human, NASA Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy. Colonel Pam Melroy was sworn in as the NASA Deputy Administrator on June 21. As Deputy Administrator Melroy performs the duties and exercises the powers delegated by the Administrator, assists the Administrator in making final agency decisions, and acts for the Administrator in his absence by performing all necessary functions to govern NASA operations. Administrator Melroy is also responsible for laying the agency's vision and representing NASA to the Executive Office of the President, Congress, heads of federal and other appropriate government agencies, international organizations, and external organizations and communities. Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy was commissioned through the Air Force Reserve Officers Training Corps, ROTC, in 1983. As a co-pilot, aircraft commander, instructor pilot, and test pilot, Melroy has logged more than 6,000 flight hours in more than 50 different aircraft before retiring from the Air Force in 2007. She is a veteran of Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and Operation Just Cause with more than 200 combat and combat, combat support hours. She was selected as an astronaut candidate by NASA in December 1994. Initially assigned to astronaut support duties for launch and landing, she also worked advanced projects for the astronaut office. She performed capsule communicator or CAPCOM duties in mission control. In addition, she served on the Columbia Reconstruction Team as the lead for the crew module and served as deputy project manager for the Columbia Crew Survival Investigation Team. In her final position, she served as branch chief for the Orion branch of the astronaut office. One of only two women to command a space shuttle, Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy logged more than 38 days, 924 hours in space. She served as pilot on two flights, STS-92 in 2000 and STS-112 in 2002, and was the mission commander on STS-120 in 2007. All three of her missions were assembly missions to build the International Space Station. After serving more than two decades in the Air Force and as a NASA astronaut, Melroy took on a number of leadership roles, including at Lockheed Martin, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Nova Systems Australia, and as an advisor to the Australian Space Agency. She also has served as an independent consultant and a member of the National Space Council's Users Advisory Group. She holds a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from Wellesley College and a master's degree in earth and planetary sciences from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It is with extreme privilege and pleasure to introduce to you tonight, NASA Deputy Administrator, Pam Melroy. Thank you. Well, I bring you greetings and regrets from Administrator Bill Nelson. Uh, as I told him when he uh, let me know that he was feeling under the weather, no one is sorry if you stay home if you feel sick right now. So he's disappointed, uh, but on the other hand, it brings me an opportunity to join you here today, which is very exciting. So I'm extremely pleased to be here and uh, especially pleased to be at the George Washington University. So when we think about the future, the who the first explorers to set foot on Mars will be, who I believe are somewhere alive, walking the Earth, maybe toddling uh, in school, uh, it's very inspiring to think about that. And it's this generation that fills the halls that is going to take us there, the Artemis generation. By and large, it's important to remember that it was young people who filled the stands when uh, at Rice University on September 12, 1962, when they heard President Kennedy issue a bold declaration that America would choose to go to the moon. I don't know, sometimes I think about it, I wonder what did those in attendance feel or think that day? Did it sound crazy? 
Or did it sound like a daring call to action? How inspiring that must have been to feel that sense of possibility. And I think the other wonderful thing is a sense of national unity. So it's a vision that would go on to inspire and define that generation, the Apollo generation. And I was a part of that. I was very inspired by the first moon landing, and that was my decision to want to become an astronaut by watching that landing. So here we are six decades later, and you know what? America is still capable of doing incredibly hard things. And we're very excited about our next big, bold thing with us. And we're gonna be bringing the world with us this time. And Mars is on the horizon. By using what we learn on and around the moon under the Artemis program, NASA will lead humanity's mission to Mars. We will work to overcome the challenges of landing, living, and leaving the, re the red planet to come home. So when you think about why, I think it's pretty clear. I talk to a lot of people about why we send humans out to explore. First of all, exploration, of course, but for science, for the things that we can learn, to increase our nation's capabilities, and for the benefit of those here on Earth. And finally, to inspire. By that, I mean not just inspiring students to study STEM, but inspiring us to think about what humans are capable of and to be proud of what we can accomplish together. Science tells us more about life on Earth, and it's teaching us some pretty surprising things about the rest of the solar system as well. And one of the things we think could just about revolutionize everything we understand would be to find life on Mars and be able to compare it to the biology that developed here on Earth. And Perseverance is starting that process right now. Our full Mars sample return mission, which will be extremely challenging, uh, in the early 2030s, as in a partnership with ESA, will help give us more clarity than ever about whether or not life existed on Mars and potentially where the best places to find it would be. It's a top priority of the science community, and it's one we're very excited about as we make real progress towards that huge goal. So we often talk about when we're going to go to Mars, but we have to actually start with how. How are we going to do it? So how does NASA sustain human presence and exploration throughout the solar system? How do we harness the power of propulsion necessary for the journey to and from the red planet? How do we cultivate sustainable food production systems on a hostile planet? These are actually just a few of the questions that we've been asking, and we've been taking a deep dive. We have 50 high-level objectives in NASA's initial Moon to Mars framework strategy. And we released those 50 objectives today publicly, and we will be taking comments on them through the end of the month. Each of the objectives currently falls into four overarching categories. First, transportation and habitation. Obviously, you have to be able to get there, get home, and survive. Infrastructure. If we truly want to explore the solar system, especially the further away we go, we have to have infrastructure to support the long journeys that we will be going on. If we want to maximize our science return on other planets, we have to be able to stay long enough to really reap the benefits. And we need infrastructure to enable a sustained presence. Operations, how do humans work and perform on another planet doing science? We know a lot about microgravity. Right now, we know very well how humans can do science efficiently on the International Space Station. This is going to be very different when we're operating on the surface of, an, of another planet. And of course, science, one of the pillars of the reasons why we go. We have got to be extremely clear about exactly what we need to achieve on the moon to get to Mars. NASA's mission directorates I have tasked them and challenged them to work together in a unified position, a consensus of our top technical leaders at the agency to develop these moon to Mars objectives that are going to act for us as the guideposts 
over the next two decades as individual programs and projects and technologies advance and come online and work together. It'll help ensure that the things that we're doing are integrated and that we are focused on Mars as a target. We're gonna to need to dig deeply into each of these areas and really unpack those objectives for the long-term human presence on the moon that we can then translate to Mars. So we will develop this blueprint framework and then we will demonstrate it on Mars. Now, I just wanna talk for a moment about some of those objectives. I talked about transportation and habitation and operations. I think those are pretty clear. We talk about those a lot. A lot of the systems that we have are aimed at keeping people alive and transporting them. But my point about the infrastructure is very important. We really need to be thinking about a scalable and an affordable infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean things like communications, position navigation and timing, power, in source resource, in situ resource utilization, and even things like prepared landing strips and many other things. I also wanna talk about our science objectives. As I said, science is one of the pillars of the reasons why we go to space. And to me, it's very exciting that we are working to integrate our science objectives into everything that we do from the very beginning. You know, the administrator has a picture painted by the uh, legendary artist Bob McCall in his office. And it shows an Apollo astronaut wielding a science tool. You know what it is? It's a scoop on the end of a stick. And that was their primary science tool to pick up samples. Now, those samples are more precious than gold. They have been amazing at helping us understand more about the moon and the formation of the solar system. But you know what? I think we can do better than that now. I think we know how to do science a little differently. I was so thrilled when I saw the recommendation in the recent decadal survey that suggested maybe we should think about human robotic teaming. And the idea was maybe we have a fleet of AI-enabled rovers that go around and collect samples in the most interesting places and then pre and place them together for our astronauts to bring home. I think about things like, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we had scientists here on Earth wearing a virtual reality headset, looking at what astronauts were looking at and passing the word, that one, I want that rock, bring that one home. <laughs> and think about just some of the exciting things that we're working on right now, a hopper that will sit on the back of a rover and will hop up to two kilometers down deep into a shadowed crater, take samples, and then hop back. So those are just a few examples of the ways that I think we can do really creative and amazing and efficient science on the moon to prepare us to go to Mars. So it goes without saying that sending humans to Mars is a tremendous challenge. We have a lot of things that we have to do, and I think the objectives really highlight the roadmap of things that we have to achieve. It's an engineering challenge, it's a technological challenge, it's an agricultural challenge, and it's a human challenge. So these objectives are gonna help us methodically tick off what we need to do to be ready to go to Mars. For example, to minimize the radiation of deep space, we need to invest in propulsion systems. These systems can get us, our astronauts, to Mars faster. To explore further and to learn about the solar system we live in, we need to take advantage of what's already there in the environment. And we need to invest in the technology to land, sustain, and then launch our astronauts off the surface. A great example of current ISRU work is MOXIE, which is on the surface of Mars with the Perseverance rover, and it's created oxygen for the first time out of Mars' thin atmosphere. We're gonna have to ramp up and increase those capabilities and demonstrate the ability that we know how to operate on a surface to create oxygen for our astronauts. And we're gonna need it to create rocket fuel to power their journey home for maximum efficiency. So last week, we shared some very exciting news from a NASA-funded study in partnership with the University of Florida. And researchers grew plants in nutrient-poor 
lunar regolith for the first time ever. By studying how the plants responded to the lunar samples, the team hopes to pave the way to grow more nutrient-rich plants for the moon and Mars. And of course, our full fleet, we have quite a fleet of rovers, orbiters, and a lander already at Mars, which is teaching us about the ge geology, the planet's core. Do you see the news about the six hour long earthquake, Mars quake, very cool, local weather, how spacesuit material may degrade over time. Those are the kinds of experiments we need to do. So you can see we've been doing a lot as far as it comes to scouting ahead. We're sending our robotic scouts. And now with the objectives, we're gonna establish a blueprint for how we're gonna get the learning that we need on the ground on the moon that will take us to Mars. So Mars has just been forever our horizon goal. But this administration is really serious about charting our path towards those groundbreaking missions, answering the questions of how we're gonna get there and what science we will conduct on the surface. You know, we really can't do this without you. Earlier today, as I mentioned, NASA released our initial Moon to Mars framework objectives, and we are actively seeking your feedback on those objectives. We, we really need you to respond to this call. We want to hear the input of NASA's workforce, which is second to none, and our crown jewel. We want the perspectives of our partners in industry and academia. We want to hear from the American people. We are so proud to be America's space program. And our job is to provide benefit to the American citizen. We want to hear from those stakeholders. And we want to hear from our international partners because America is not going to do this alone. That's one of our foundational principles. We will review your comments and take into consideration what the community is saying, what we might have missed, where we might need to go further. And we're gonna hold stakeholder workshops later this year to discuss what we have heard from you. So this feedback, it's important to understand will inform our exploration plans at the Moon and Mars for the next 20 years. There will be our guidepost. We're looking within NASA and to our external stakeholders to help us fine tune those objectives and create consensus among all of our stakeholders that we have it right. We also want to be as transparent as possible throughout the process. That is very important. And with this approach, as I mentioned, we're going to find potential gaps in our architecture. And we're also going to find areas where our goals align with our industry partners' goals and also where our international partners' goals are so that we can figure out how are we going to partner with them in this architecture. So I do have to say, there isn't, this isn't a formal request for information or anything to do with a procurement activity. It's really building a consensus about what the things we need to demonstrate, develop, and achieve are. But through this cooperative and what we hope is a resilient objectives-based uh, approach, NASA aims to integrate all of our efforts across industry, across our international partners, and what we're doing. We think that's going to reduce the overall cost to the American taxpayer and better adjust to changes in funding. That's what I mean by resilience. And I also always want to talk about this when I, when I talk about us going to the moon and Mars. How we go is as important as what we do. And so there's one reason I'm so excited that 19 nations have signed the Artemis Accords with others on the way to join that community. These are basic principles and a, uh, of rules of the road, agreements that we've made. Right now, the Outer Space Treaty is all that we have. We can go a little bit further, particularly as we're starting to challenge some of those principles, some of which are in tension with each other. So we need to get down to it and say, how are we going to do this? Do it in a transparent way, do it in an open way. We think that with basic rules of the road, we can usher in a new era of cooperation in space that brings the best of humanity to the solar system. And that's one reason I'm very happy to be here at the Humans to Mars Summit. We really need you. So if you're a member of our NASA family, you belong to a workforce second to none, and I'm very proud of you. If you work for our industry partners, 
Our plans for future exploration are deeply intertwined and we cannot go without you. If you represent an international partner, your expertise and your friendship are needed more than ever. And if you're a student or a young person early in their career, you represent a new generation, the Artemis generation. You could be one of the ones to visit Mars in person or work on the many facets of the missions that I've described here today. I understand this where I'm at in my career. I see that it's your generation that is going to enable American adventurers to land on, live on, and leave the red planet and maybe become the first true Martians. So it's not gonna be easy. There's going to be a lot of challenges on the way. But one of the things that we do is we define those challenges and we methodically tackle them. I believe this generation and this country and our partners are ready to meet this challenge. So I'll finish up where I started today with President Kennedy's speech 60 years ago. He quoted British explorer George Mallory, specifically his answer for why he dared climb Mount Everest, and of course the famous response, because it's there. I think our response is a lot more nuanced, uh, but it's no less bold. The Red Planet is a destination for scientific discovery. It's a driver of technologies that will help humans here on Earth, but also enable us to travel and explore. It will strengthen our nation's capabilities, and it will inspire a whole generation that is eager to put its own mark and build on what we have done to and will achieve together. So humans visiting Mars in person, I believe will truly change civilization. So Mars is calling us, let's answer the call. And together we'll prove that the dream is no longer deferred. Thank you. <laughs>